Okay, I am having a wonderful uh, chat already uh, with Nicholas Daniel, oboist with Camerata Pacifica, among a million other things. Uh, I am in Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful, gorgeous, sunny afternoon, and uh, Nick Nick is uh, is near Cambridge. It's dark. We're talking. It's, dark, it's getting down towards freezing. <laughs> oh, still, wow. Hmm. I yeah, had fr- well, the, day, the daytimes are now much warmer, but um, yeah. the the evenings are still cold. My daffodils are not happy about it. <laughs> and, and I had forgotten. I I had blocked the weather out of my student days in London in memory. Uh, we are talking about the, we're going to chat a little bit about the next, uh, the upcoming uh, Camerata Pacifica concert uh, set. It's coming up mm-hmm. in April and I'm going to throw it through, we're going to talk about the Santa Barbara performances because mm-hmm. of course I'm in Santa Barbara and I want to address the Santa Barbara audience, but because mm-hmm. a lot of people watch this, uh, my little video uh, interviews here throughout Southern California. I'm going to give you all the dates. So let me get that out of the way up front. You can take a nap, Nick, and I'll, I'll get this done. <laughs> We're talking about Camerata Pacifica, uh, Adrian Spence, artistic director and magical person, uh, if I may say so. Uh, fabulous, probably wor- really literally world class. We'll talk about that in a minute, Nick. Uh, world class musicians involved. Here's the schedule for their April set of concerts. And this is really a charming uh, concert. Uh, whoever set this one up, uh, it's, a, it's a beauty. Probably Adrian, but we'll speak about that too, because there are some Brits in, involved in this programming. Uh, Sunday, April 6th in Ventura, Camerata Pacifica. Tuesday, April 8th in Pasadena. Thursday, April 10th in Los Angeles at the Zipper Hall, the fabulous, gorgeous Zipper Hall. And then Friday, April 11th in Santa Barbara. And there'll be two uh, events, as those of you in Santa Barbara know. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, April 11th at uh, Han Hall at the Music Academy of the West. A kind of a shorter program. And then at 7.30 that evening, Friday, April 11th at Han Hall, the the full program. And here's the uh, fascinating, as always, uh, program. We've got Jake Heggie, an American, a soliloquy for uh, solo and piano, uh, flute and piano. We have Thea Musgrave, and she uh, taught out at UCSB uh, as head of composition at UCSB for many, many years. And an amazing uh, piece. Let me see if I can find it here in my house. It's for flute and digital delay. I've forgotten the title. We can talk about that a little Narcissus. bit. Oh, Narcissus. Yes. Well, one of her most famous, now that I think about it, Narcissus, I think. That rings big bells. Uh, Anywho, and that, then we have, to, we have, and Thea Musgrave is Scottish. I've learned at the 11th hour to save me. Uh, then two really wonderful British composers. Herbert Howells, his oboe sonata with ours truly. Uh, Nick Daniel is the uh, featured oboeist. And Madeleine Dring. And I had never heard of this amazing, marvelous woman. I'll want to spend a little... You know, you had a bright light there for a minute, and then it went out. So if anything changes, eh, whatever. I'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Anywho, uh, there it goes, on and off again. Uh, Madeleine Dring and this woman's trio for flute, oboe, and piano, I want, I do want to spend a, a minute or two with you on uh, mm-hmm. d- discussing. And then, of course, uh, you know, we've got Mozart. Just the piano quintet of Mozart. This is one of his most charming wind and piano uh pieces, I think. So that's the program. Uh, Jake Heggie, Thea Musgrave, uh, Herbert Howells, Madeleine Dring, and Wolfgang, and perhaps a lot of people are saying, who are they? I know one of them, they're saying, perhaps. And this, I'm, I'm giving this preamble because I think it's very important. This is exactly the mission of Adrian Spence. First, get an audience trust, and then give them real meaty, juicy, wonderful, exciting repertoire. So, can I call you Nick? I know I know Nick Ormrod in Britain, and I just Nicholas is just too many syllables. Is that okay? <laughs> Nicholas, when I'm when I'm written. <laughs> there, there you so, go. Nick okay. is fine. Thank you so much. All right, all right. Uh, I'm Dan, of course. Yes. I have the same problem. It's Daniel when it's written out formally. And exactly. Everybody calls me Dan. Uh, any, any, anyway, uh, uh, Nick Daniel is all is not only okay. We're going to say this possibly, maybe even at least one of the best oboists in the world and we we'll, and this is no kidding i've watched this guy play for some years now and an astonishing control over one of the most horrifying instruments i'm a clarinetist and luckily uh when richard stoltzman said make reeds i said thanks very much i'll be a conductor okay that was in cal arts <laughs> a million years ago and uh, uh oboes and bassoons as most everybody knows have to make their own reeds and this is just a nightmare i don't understand it let's start there if you don't mind which is how could any kid 
suddenly become inspired at age whatever you're going to tell us with an instrument that you know fights you for years <laughs> well it doesn't fight you if you're properly taught that's uh, the thing it um it and when you're little you have instruments the junior starter instruments are not as resistant not as problematic and you don't have to make your own reeds when you're little people make them for you it's expensive what you need is a little bit of money unfortunately because it's it's you can't buy you can probably buy a flute for a hundred dollars it wouldn't be brilliant but you certainly couldn't buy an oboe for for less than ten times that even a very even a starter model this is a problem something that that some of us are trying to sort out a little bit with uh, some of the makers in the world but the thing is that what what tends to happen with oboists is you get a kind of crazy kid <laughs> and they sort of sort of do a bit of listening and a bit of thinking and they go to their mum and dad you know what? I want to play the oboe. The what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but with me, it was very different because I I've been singing in my local church choir. My parents were churchgoers, and obviously they dragged me along too. Um, and then I sang in the church choir, and then uh, my voice became very very good. And I and I was lucky, blessed with a with an amazing treble voice. I'm told I haven't got any recordings of it because this was quite a long time ago. Um, but what happened was that my my mother thought it'd be an idea for me to go in for a cathedral school. So we have these incredible cathedral schools in this country, in Britain, who have uh, resident choirs at, with a private school attached to it. You get a huge chunk off the school fees, which is always nice. Um, and in order to be a chorister, you had to learn two instruments. And so I I played the piano from very young because my mother had given me the choice between horse riding and playing the piano, and I thought horse riding sounded a bit dangerous. <laughs> you are a nerd, aren't you? Jeez. <laughs> so, um, so I took up Excuse took me. up the piano, and then and then my I didn't know what other instrument, but my grandmother said the boy must play the oboe. <laughs> so, Granny was kind of wonderful, wonderful, very very sweet, gentle, loving, but quite commanding person. Um, and uh, so the boy took up the oboe and he, he did very well very quickly and I was it just it just seemed to me that it was exactly the same as singing and when my voice slipped and then finally broke I was left with the voice I had left with my was my oboe so that's that's what and it's exactly the same range as a, as a boy treble exactly the same range and so I I sort of feel that singing is is I sing with the instrument it sings from me that's really how I, and everything, every even when I'm playing the most contemporary, most extreme, most virtuosic piece, I'm still always trying to sing with the instrument, even if it's very, very, very fast and crazy. Um, I'm still trying to make it sing. And when I when I did the Elliot Carter concerto, and Carter was was listening in, and I did it at the proms, and you can actually see it on YouTube on my YouTube channel, which is N Daniel Music. Um, this uh, fantastic piece, but very very complex and he just said everything must sing everything must sing make it sing so I thought yeah that's just up my street so luckily that's that's kind of how it all started and uh, it's it's been very good to me it's such a funny thing I call it puffing down a twig because that's basically <laughs> what you're doing because <laughs> the reed is actually made from in very good um, uh, wine growing areas it's not necessarily combined with wine and reed making but um, in very good wine making areas like California you can get very good reed cane and of course south of France, Spain, Israel, Hungary, um, Argentina um, and the cane is called a rondo donax and it's, it just grows in the water you see it all over California in the watery areas so we make those reeds ourselves. It's a long, boring process. I won't tie you with, but uh, yeah. But it's actually reed cane that grows in water that you turn into this thing that crows and makes a sound, and then that makes the sound of the oboe. So while we're there, my first and only rude question. I knew an oboe a, a family, and uh, the, the two kids that I knew were an oboist and a bassoonist, and they always seemed to me to smell kind of funny. And I thought that was because they were always making reeds and had all that rope and stuff. Is there anything to this? Am I just, uh, I need to get over this. You don't smell funny, eh? I invite anybody to come and sniff me. I <laughs> smell good. Okay, that puts that one to rest. Now let's see what I'm I... alone is my, is my <laughs> goddess. When I stop blushing, we'll be able to continue. Uh, so we understand something about the, that your career really as an oboist began at about the age of 18. If I got that right, the competition yeah. uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and so now, just to, then we're going to deal with the program. I've got to keep track of time here, but I'm, now I'm curious about when does the other, when does that other uh, thing as a, as a, 
clarinetist cum slash conductor. When does that other thing called, ooh, I'd like to stand up in front of some people and make some music. When did that hit, conducting? Well, it was comparatively recently, I suppose about 10, 15 years ago. Basically, um, I, I'd always thought that it might be something I wanted to do, but I resisted it very, very strongly because I felt that it was probably just my ego talking and that I should be satisfied with what I've got and commissioning pieces is such a great thing to do. I've commissioned hundreds of pieces from different composers. It's really a major repertoire for the future. So I thought maybe that's enough. And then somebody asked me to conduct something with a recording for them. And um, I just felt as though I'd suddenly got the wind beneath my wings. And um, I've been developing it. I'm, I, it's, it's quite hard in a way because I still fight that thing of, of worrying that, um, that there's a sort of ego side of it. And I, it's becoming, it's just such an English thing to say, I know. But the, the thing is, I just really, I really want to remain true to my musical principles. And, um, and it's quite hard to, to do it unless you're prepared to kind of give up. People want me to give up the oboe to do it. And I no, no, no. don't want to do that. And I've seen a lot of pe very good musicians give up their instruments in order to conduct. And actually, I, I would rather do it a different way if it takes a little longer. Um, and I've got a lot to say with the instrument, and I, I find, um, you know, more and more I find that my, my voice is, is my singing voice, my instrumental voice is my singing voice, and, and I can't do without it. So I'm just, you know, working away, doing what comes up. I do some great conducting work and um, have some fantastic experiences and, 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 and get immerse myself in major masterpieces. But I'll tell you something. Being an oboist is an awful lot easier than being a conductor for one very major reason. If you take maybe the most famous oboe concerto, perhaps the Strauss oboe concerto, how many times have you heard that piece? I've heard it more than most, but uh, not often. Maybe four or five times? Yeah. How many times have you heard Beethoven's Seventh Symphony? Yeah. Here, here. So, the, what, when I walked on stage in Sweden, in, in Jönköping, to conduct Beethoven's Seventh for the first time, I walked, just about to walk on stage, went, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> thinking about, you know, clamber, <laughs> rattle, a bardo. And, and, you know, the thing is on the oboe, uh, there are great precedents, antecedents of mine, but in a way, I have a bit more of an original hand, a bit more, a bit more chance for the audience to believe me first time rather than comparing it to their great recordings. Um, oboists will always compare, you can't get past them. But um, somehow, so I think, so what I've tried to do is add slowly to my conducting repertoire and try and be as, as truthful and authentic with that as I am with the oboe. That's exactly what Joshua Bell has told me. He is also trend making this transition. He's having doing a little more conducting with Sir Martin in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, he, he says essentially the same. I just saw him perform last week here in Santa Barbara with them. And he is functioning beautifully as a conductor from the chair. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, so he I think he's moving in the same way perhaps you are. And of course yes. your your level of uh, of musicianship as an I mean as an oboist it would it's a travesty it's not to be allowed that you would just no. shove off into conducting. Tell you another way in which um I found it's helpful in terms of conducting and playing is that that I've done a lot of teaching over my life and I would describe myself as a very committed teacher. And um, somehow, th when you're coaching or, t or teaching, what I'm trying to do is to get the very best from people, to make them find their sound. Um, and although when I conduct, I find I, my orchestras do have a sound, it's my sound, they also, I want them to be themselves, I want them to be relaxed and be themselves. So helping people feel relaxed in that way, in a social way, is, I don't mean socially, but I mean in a social way inside an orchestra, is, is, is something I think I have a, a skill at. I think Josh is, I mean, I met him for the first time the other day, we, our paths have never crossed, although I actually I taught at Bloomington for a while, but it was after he left, yeah. but um, I, I, I really do admire him, because if I've heard anything else, he's not just gone in there, played a concerto, then stand up waving his arms, what he's done is he, sit, he, he sits with the orchestra and directs from the violin, and he's learning a lot about the music from that. And it's, it's, very, it's a very successful collaboration, it's given that orchestra a whole new um, lease of life, yes. I would say. I heard them. I heard them without him actually last year when I was there exactly a year ago, and that was that was also a great concert. 
Mm. And I remember when Neville Mariner conducted the orchestra. A 90 years old this week. Know, Oh, he's still, he too is still alive. Oh my God, there's hope for us all. <laughs> and that um, don't die easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, wait, let's start about, let's talk about the program here because time is, yeah. is slipping by and people have such a, such limited interest time, ju uh, uh, justifiably, let's say, in this busy world. Uh, so we're, the, the program is going to have two flute works, Thea Musgrave's piece, as we discussed, and Jake Heggie's piece, and, and I really want to hear a little bit more about the two oboe works, the oboe sonata of Herbert Howells, English composer, and this really enchanting trio, composed in 1968, I think, mm -hmm. uh, when everybody else was going through the Sturm und Drang of the, of the, of the uh, Cold War, this literally, I hate to be corny, but walk in a country garden of uh, Madeleine Dring's, this trio for flute, oboe, and piano. Go. Tell me about these two works. Well, I'll talk about the, the Dring first, as you've mentioned it. Um, Madeline Dring was, was a, a singer and pianist. She, she used to sing while she played the piano herself. Mm. And so she wrote a large body of extremely beautiful songs. She was a pupil of Vaughan Williams, actually. And um, she had in, in common with Vaughan Williams that she was synesthetic and that when she heard a key or a certain note, she would see colour. Um, this is a very interesting subject to me, we'll talk about it more another time. But she was married, as it happened, to a very, very fine oboist, a man called Roger Lord, who's still alive now, and he was the first oboe of the London Symphony. And um, she wrote quite a few delicious, I mean, that's the best word for it, charming, delicious, tasteful, gorgeous little pieces, quite light, but always with a sweetness to them and harmonic, extreme harmonic beauty, she didn't, she wasn't interested in Darmstadt or any of that stuff, she just did her thing. And some of the best composers sometimes are people who live outside their own time. You could say, actually, that the composers such as Herbert Howells, maybe Vaughan Williams, maybe even Britain, lived very successfully outside the time they were living in. There's a kind of... Um, Oboist is a one of those who was an incredible British oboist of the period, who Howells wrote the sonata for. He, he had so many pieces written for him. And many of these composers, I think of them as the romantic repertoire that the oboe has missing, because in the romantic era, the oboe was not a soloistic instrument. The piano, the violin, to a lesser extent the cello was, but particularly the piano, um, and bit larger forms um, dominated. And then with the oboe's sort of development, what happened was that composers realized with an artist like Goosens that they can have a very successful oboe and string orchestra, oboe orchestra, oboe string quartet, oboe piano, all these different formats. And so they wrote a lot. So I have a wonderful repertoire, some of which I've played in, um, in over there in, in California. Uh, the Bax Quintet we played recently, oh, yes. another Goosens piece. And in fact, when I first came, this is my seventh season as a matter of fact, but when I first came, one of the first pieces I played for Camerata Pacifica was the Herbert Howe Sonata with Warren Jones. And I have to say that playing with Warren is just one of the most enjoyable things that you could do on a concert stage. It's it's like being carried on a it's like being on a hovercraft. You feel as if you're floating on a, a sound which is softer than a feather bed and yet it's got rhythmic, incredible rhythmic strength. Um, and he understood this piece. He came to love this piece. He learnt it with me learnt it for me. Um, I'd played it for many years and had done the first recording of it back in the 80s um, when I was very, very young. The House is a huge piece. It's a 25-minute, 24-minute sonata in four movements, two connected and two connected. And it was written in London during the Blitz in 1942. Um, it was never performed because How Howells played it through with Goosens and Goosens said, you know, old boy, I think it needs a bit more work. <laughs> Goosens was a very, I would describe him as a very particular person. Um, that's what a word my husband uses. Is a, my darling, he's a very particular person. <laughs> yes, he was, I mean, he, he just had a very unique position. But the thing is, sight reading it would have been absolutely crazy because the piece is really, really substantial and very hard for both parties. Howells, of course, was a, would, have, would have been able to play his own piano part most likely, but the oboe part would have been fearsome to sight read. Um, so I think probably Howells, who was notoriously unconfident about his own music, uh, and 
and probably just thought, oh, well, I'll just put that away. And he wrote a clarinet sonata for Frederick Thurston two years later, which became very successful and has been played ever since. And then after Howells died, this piece was rediscovered as a slightly it's a long story how it came to be discovered but I was sent it and I just from the first moment I put my hands on the piano and played the piano part through before I even put the oboe in my mouth and played the oboe part I just was crazy about the piece it's one of my very very favorite pieces it's a huge journey um, and it uses the piano in the most wonderful way almost like an organ with very very deep rich pedal sounds he's often reaching right to the left all the way to the left to play the very bottom note of the piano. It's incredibly rich harmonic sound. The phrases are absolutely huge. They are, they're each musical sentence is, is the size of a, of a movement of a Bach sonata, literally. They're it's huge, huge shapes. Um, but it's a shape that works really well. There's a slow movement that he drew from a song he'd written much, much earlier, all about hanging garlands on doors. And I researched this. This idea of hanging garlands on doors is connected to um, illness and the Black Death and when someone's died in the house. They used to think that it would ward off evil spirits and that the the smell would, would take away um, from the smell of the dead. So this this is not just about Christmas. It's all about, um, about death and life and continuity and the colour green. Yeah. And then there's this really, really powerful and very energetic, slightly jazzy almost, last movement, which links into a massive epilogue, um, which then ends somehow in the way you started. So you have this sense of circularity about the piece. Um, and I love the way Warren described it when we talked about it. He, we did it about three or four times, and then he said, I'd like to introduce it tonight. I said, Warren, that's great, you, you talk about it. He described it as, as having a ball of string and you go for a long, long journey with this ball of string, letting it out piece by piece. And when you come back to what you think the end of a journey, then you find the first piece of string you dropped in the first place. It's a beautiful way of describing it. It's, I mean, it really is one of my most favorite pieces, and, and I think it's got a language that anybody would, would understand. Excuse me. Uh, also, uh, there's a kind of an analogy, I think, if this was composed during the Second World War. Uh, when you said garland, my, the image in my mind was wreath, the black wreath, and in a way, kind of sort of the same thing, imagery might have been in his mind as well in, in that time. Yeah. And of course, it's going to be such a joy to, to play the Mozart piano and wind with, with Warren as well. Um, and with my lovely colleagues, and in fact, I'm, I've, I've discussed and, and have uh, suggested to Adrian a, a new colleague in the French horn department, and this is my, my compatriot, Mr. Martin Owen. And, um, Martin is uh, just, phew, last time I saw him, he was playing first horn for a year with the Berlin Philharmonic, <laughs> and he's principal horn of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, and he's just played... Thea Musgrave's Horn Concerto, um, live on the radio in London, and Thea was there for that. Um, so he's got the Thea Musgrave stamp of approval as well, but he is a wonderful player, lovely man. I've known him for many years, and um, he's someone I feel really comfortable playing on a stage with. Um, with Camerata, the, the name, in a way, says it all. We're all good friends, and so it's helpful for, for us to know somebody to bring them in. Um, and he's just a wonderful person, a wonderful player, it's most beautiful sound, warm sound. I, I'm sure my, my, my beloved audiences there are going to like him very much. He's a nice guy. And this is his first performance uh, with Camerata? It is. Aha! Nice. Thank you for the scoop. <laughs> uh, probably I'm the last one to hear it. Uh, let's see. Let me let me just uh, see what we're missing because we're running a little tight here. Let's see. Um, we have sp spoken about uh, the Madeleine Tring work, uh, the trio for flute, oboe, and piano. Just to say one more thing about that is that yes. the slow movement of that Madeleine Tring has one of the best tunes in mm. all of 20th century music. It's seriously great tunes. Beautiful. Great fun to play it together. Yeah, we haven't talked about um, Jake Heggie's lovely nice. piece. Um, and of no, course, I, I understood that to be for something else, for flute and piano. It is. Okay, but, but you want to talk about it. That. Please do. Oh. <laughs> Aren't I allowed to talk about flute? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's so wonderful about the Jake Heggie piece is it was written in, in memory of a lady called Suzanne Malouk, and, and she was the sister of Lucy Jansen, who's she and oh, Richard yes. Jansen are great, great supporters of the arts in, yeah. in Santa Barbara, um, and very, very dear friends of mine. And um, 
it's a wonderful thing that this piece exists because unfortunately between its commissioning and its first performance Suzanne died mm. so it's a piece that means a lot to to Lucy and a lot to Adrian and and uh, to any of those of us who who love Lucy and Richard so it's a very special piece and Narcissus Narcissus is is a piece of madness because it's this is Thea Musgrave let's remind everyone this is Thea Musgrave yeah. yeah she was 85 now she must have written this maybe 20 years ago um, and it's a piece where the flute player has a set of foot pedals, and um, and uh, it you have to uh, there's a sort of special setup with a computer, um, so that you you can play something with your foot on the pedal and then it repeats. It becomes like a background. Um, if anybody's seen that, the latest techniques of this are you can see somebody there's a guy on a trombone doing it with um, with a. Um, uh, um, a song, a pop song at the moment, and you can see that on the internet. It's just uh, on bone on a loop. And let me you jump know. in. <laughs> uh, we we Americans saw that just a couple of nights ago. I by accident. The Tonight Show. Somebody, a famous jazz uh, pianist or something, or singer, uh, and the host, and they did their little loops on their uh, uh, what do you the flat uh-huh. screen. If you if you, if you, if you Google Vida La Loca Coldplay trombone on a loop. If you, if you Google that, you'll find this guy doing it. It's exactly the same technique. But, of course, Thea's, Thea's piece is done with such massive integrity. And it's all about Narcissus, who fell in love with his own reflection and therefore was the gods in, 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 in anger and, and laughter turned him into the flower that we know as a Narcissus, which is exactly from this time of year in, in this part of the world. Mm. Yeah, um, that's that's yeah. a sweet bit of programming <laughs> coincidence, or not. Narcissus. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we're, we're, is this uh, another Adrian Spence kind of programming, or did you have some input? Well, the only input I had was that in the very first program I did for Camerata Pacifica, which was a, a, a two-interval marathon of about three 45-minute halves all featuring me, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> which was kind of my audition for the group, really. I suggested that we did the Howl Sonata and gave him my recording of it. And he, of course, has has always remembered that piece and how much people loved it. I mean, I just remember in Ventura, which is which is a wonderful audience as well. Um, there's a lot of people just stood up when they heard the end of that piece. It's just so beautiful, um, and I think it's just he's remembered it. And this this season, to an extent, from Adrian is is remembering some favourite moments from past seasons. No, it's totally his work. I mean. You, we can suggest pieces to him, but in a way I, I agree with his way of programming, which is it needs to be no kind of democracy, actually. It needs to be absolutely um, uh, a singular vision, and then it's like him, it's love it or, or don't don't love it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's absolutely clear that he has a, a, a incredibly original programming ideas. Um, uh, the, there are some of the programs I've looked at and just wondered how they would work and then you hear them you go well that's just crazy and brilliant yeah. um, and this is another one that I mean I know this is going to work beautifully because I know some of the pieces um, have I've heard them together before like the drilling in the house but uh, I think it's, it's going to be a brilliant program and then having the Mozart at the end which is such a celebratory piece in so many ways and it's a piece that Mozart of course himself wrote to his father and said this is the best of me. And when you have Mozart saying, you know what, I think I've done a good one here, Dad. <laughs> He's like, okay, this piece we have to we have to enjoy. And I read that as I was prepping uh, last night, as I was listening to the just the opening bars of the quintet, of that quintet, and you instantly go, oh, this is a good one. There's something, to me, there's something very celebratory about it. And, and, um, and I don't know, I always feel it's got something about wedding it feels like when there's so many times you hear church bells in the piece oh. and of course the old cities in Europe they still now they have incredible church bells and um, it's, it's got that feeling to me and they, there's some thought that it was just after he married Constanza or that we know it was just after he married Constanza but I think there's something about it and of course in in Britain here this weekend we're, we're celebrating that the same sex couples can marry for the first time and and be uh, equal to everybody else. So we're we're kind of celebrating marriage in every way at the moment. So it's on my mind. Maybe that's no, where the idea I, I came guess it's from. No wonder you're hearing wedding bells and church bells and marvelous. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and we were, we were referring to the Mozart quintet, the uh, the 
quintet for piano and wind uh, on this program. Uh, we're going to have to leave. I would love, we'll, we'll talk again on other subjects because I have met a Hollywood composer, a young woman, I've forgotten her name just now, who is, what is that again? Saracenet, Saracenetic or whatever? Synesthetic, yeah. Synesthetic. Synesthetic, thank you for correcting me. It's a very useful thing to be for a film composer because you can, you can actually copy what you see on the screen in certain ways. Yes. It's good. Yeah. yeah, so it's a fascinating subject all by itself, but, but you're, you're telling me that uh, Herbert Howells, this piece is green. <laughs> yeah, something like that? Do you know, luckily it's not my bag, but <laughs> Madeline Dring was synesthetic, and so oh, was Paul Williams. Oh, okay, sorry, so it was Madeline. Was, so was Ravel, his teacher. Really? Yeah. Oh. They kept it quiet, apparently. Uh, let's see. We're done. Let me give the phone number for Santa Barbara ticket sales. This is Han Hall, the glorious chamber hall in Santa Barbara uh, on the Music Academy of the West Campus. You can't go wrong on that one. We're talking about there are four engagements throughout Southern California. So, you know, you look at your local TV guides or something. But we're talking in Santa Barbara on Friday, April 11th one in the afternoon for a sort of mini performance and then at 7.30 the full concert that we've been talking about. Wonderful, wonderful concert and the telephone number to call if you're going to take a trip up to Santa Barbara or if you need more information about the other venues, uh, Pasadena, Los Angeles uh, and Ventura uh, the telephone number at the Camarada Pacifica office is area code 805-884-8410 Nicholas Daniel, thank you for allowing me into your home at whatever it is. I to come back. I just so love coming there. And I, I mean, Camerato is just my number one chamber priority of anything I do anywhere. And the audiences are also my major priority. It's just a very special group of people to play for. Thank oh, you so much. Indeed. World-class music making, as I say ad nauseum. Uh, but very true. Thank you very much indeed. I'll see you in a week or so. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.